to sing, He is faithful. And He is faithful. And He is glorious. And He is Jesus. And all my hope is in Him. And He is freedom. And he is healing right now. He
know your promises are yes and amen. And all your promises are yes and amen. discerning of what you have and what you're doing and where you're moving. We 
thank you. Give us ears to hear this morning. In Jesus' name. Hey City Beautiful, as we continue in worship through giving, I want to invite you to check out the budget slide to the left. I think sometimes it's important to remember that our community is made possible by people uh, for whom City Beautiful is their actual job. Um, Ryan and Daniel, Brandy and Jeff, and that even though we can't use it as much as we'd like, we have an actual space. And all that stuff kind of costs money. So um, if you want to give uh, towards the community, there's a lot of different ways to do that. You can do it through text. You could do it online. You could write a check, I guess, and mail it in. And if you have a sock full of wadded up 20s under your floorboards, I'm sure Daniel Barr would be willing to drive out to your house to help enable your generosity. Um, so I'll give you guys a minute to uh, give online or text if you want to. And thanks again for all your generosity so far in helping this community grow. Hey everyone, Steve, one of the elders here at City Beautiful with uh, just a couple announcements this morning. Uh, first, I'm gonna be leading the Going Deeper session on evangelism, and that's gonna be at two o'clock on Zoom. You can sign up on the weekly. Um, you can probably just show up even if you don't sign up. Maybe not, I don't know, edit this out. Um, it's really for anyone. You don't have to have the spiritual gift of evangelism. We're just gonna be talking and answering questions about what it's like to share our faith and if you can actually get better at doing that and how, if you're nervous, how not to be a jerk while doing it. Uh, just a general conversational approach to what it looks like to respond to the call of God who has surely said it's up to each of us to be witnesses to the good news. Um, the other thing that I wanna point your attention towards is a shift in how we're gonna do Sunday morning. So we just felt like the community element has been lacking a little bit. And so we wanna try something uh, a little bit akin to what the first century church did, which is house churches. So um, the goal here would be to gather in small groups, maybe 10 to 15 and uh, still watch the Sunday morning sermon and worship, but together with other people who live in your neighborhood. Um, so I want you to, if you are interested in this, go to the weekly, citybeautiful.ch slash weekly and sign up with your name and phone number and address. And we're gonna figure out the best way to group people by neighborhood so that you could go maybe five minutes away and spend Sunday morning worshiping uh, safely in a, in a socially distanced and masked way uh, with other people uh, who are part of our community. And I think this will hopefully breathe a little new life into this pandemic church experience. Um, those are the only two big ones for this week. And we're gonna go into community time now. And in the chat, you can answer this question. Who is someone who has demonstrated the servant heart of Jesus to you? Thanks.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to City Beautiful Church. My name is Ryan, and this, most of you know, is Alex Ventidos. Um, we're continuing on our series called Charismata, and today we're going to be looking at three particular gifts um, that all kind of are related. You know, we've talked about how it's a little bit difficult sometimes to overparse out these gifts. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at service helps, and administration. And Alex is one of my favorite people on the planet anyway, um, but she also demonstrates a lot of these gifts. But um, Alex, I thought we'd begin. If you want to just share a little bit uh, about yourself, you've been on a journey with this community um, for quite a while now. Like, what, was, what has been that journey like for you um, in becoming really part of the fabric of City Beautiful Church? Yeah, so I have been with City Beautiful for nine years, which is wild to think of. And um, I've done a number of things in those nine years, but really what started everything is that we were still at Discovery back in the day, and I had some free time. I had just moved back to Orlando and didn't really have a job and needed to fill the void of what do I do with my life. And also was like, I could use some friends, like some new friends, that would be really great. So um, we were moving, there was a need to move chairs and to do those kinds of things, and I was like, I have the time, I can do it. And so that's how I started kind of getting involved with uh, the church, which then evolved to a number of different teams that I was a part of and leading and um, just, yeah, where we're at today. Yeah. I love that because it's like, you know, a lot of times we think about our calling has to be this like huge, tremendous moment where, you know, God writes something in the sky and it just the clouds part and it's like, here's my calling. But I think for a lot of us, it started with somebody needed to move the chairs. Yeah, a lot of chairs. <laughs> yeah, it is, but it's that, it's that willingness to take the first step yeah. um, that God leads us to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And over time, we begin to gain language for our capital C calling as we begin to examine carefully what's my personality, um, the place that God has called me to, and the gifts that he's given me to be in that spot. And we can look at the, the overlap and we say, okay, here's the grand part of my calling. Um, so today, a uh, service helps, and administration. Uh, So this is kind of the thesis, and then we're going to hit each of these three um, gifts, talk a little bit about them, um, and then kind of wrap it up with, like, what are these gifts really teaching us about Jesus? So uh, service, helps, and administration are powerful gifts that implement the practicality of Jesus to enable us to grow in maturity together. And of course, um, throughout this series, we've been talking about that little portion in Ephesians 4 where Paul says, These gifts are given to the church specifically to raise everybody up together, to know Jesus, and to raise us up in maturity, that we look more like him day by day. Nobody gets left behind. And when I think about service and helps and administration, um, I really, I see, I love these gifts because I, I see them as kind of like the skeleton or the backbone of the church, that they really, literally, these are the people that give structure to the organization so that everybody else can thrive in their respective parts. That a, like, like a body without a skeleton, a church that does not have service, helps, and administration in it is, uh, has no shape, it has no form, and no ability to really move forward. So we can't work without these gifts. Um, so even now, again, any of you that um, perhaps you know that you have one of these three gifts or you did the test that we provide and these came up high. I w- if you're watching online with us right now, I want you to go ahead and just give us a little shout out in, uh, in the chat. We want to celebrate you guys as we're going through this. Um, so last week I did um, healing and deliverance and miracles. And one of the things that I talked about there was those are the gifts that maybe those of us who are really chasing after life in the spirit would tend to idolize and kind of place on a pedestal, whereas I think um, service and helps administration are tends to be gifts that we demote. They're nice, they're practical, but when you're really serious about following Jesus and doing his work, then you're going to pursue those kinds of obviously supernatural gifts. Um, and I think that that's really tragic because, again, that's us placing human value on the gifts that God has given us in the church and, and seeing things being more valuable than maybe they really need to be and then other things being less value. And so I think these gifts, they are imperative because they show us the practicality of Jesus. When we look at the life of Jesus and his ministry, when he's preaching the good news of the kingdom, he's performing miracles and he's, he's healing people and he's raising people from the dead and he's casting out demons. But he was also doing incredibly practical things. He was developing 
um, programs and structures to help his disciples thrive so that he could build a legacy upon them that we call the modern church. And I think about, like, there's even one story, for an example, in the, in the story of Acts, which is um, the story of the first church. And um, the, the apostles who are leading the church recognize, oh my gosh, there's this vacuum in service. There's this group of widows who are kind of getting overlooked in us taking care of their daily needs. Um, so they look around, they say, okay, well, who's available? Who's got the kind of qualities that we want to put in charge? And they elect this guy, Stephen, um, to step in. And he's now overseeing, taking care of these widows and making sure the practical needs are taken care of. And if you know the story of Stephen, which we've talked about several times before, um, Stephen actually becomes the first martyr for the church that he's brought before um, the, the religious authorities of the day. And he kind of preaches this really powerful sermon about the good news of the kingdom. And they take him out and they stone him for it. Um, and so that's what happens really when you step into <laughs> acts of service is that you get stoned for it. No, but, but, <laughs> yeah. but what we see in that story, there's no delineation between uh, the supernatural and the practical. They, every gift has both of those elements in place in it. Yeah, and I think that's really important. I don't... <laughs> We're probably not going to get martyred or stoned or anything like that in today's time, thank the Lord. Um, but I think what happens oftentimes is we think of these women, these gifts. So Ryan alerted, alluded to them last week as cute gifts. And I think we think, as a joke, but I think we think sometimes that these gifts are also just um, passed on to women. So the gift of service, the gift of helps, the gift of administration, oh, that's the women's place in the church, in the organization, in a family, which could be true. I'm a woman. I have these gifts. I'm sharing that with you today. But I, what I don't want is if that's you and you think, oh, those are just like only women are equipped with that. Well, that's a lie. So like, let's uh, redeem that and say, like, no, the Lord has wired everybody with these gifts. And there are people in our lives that have these gifts that are not women who can fully step into them. And we do a disservice to the kingdom when we only focus it on women. And, and we also, the other side of that is, um, we put undue responsibility to women to stand up to these standards that maybe don't have these gifts necessarily. So it's this double side thing. So I just want to start by saying, like, if that's you or you think, oh, these are like women's only gifts, like I would challenge you to think as we go on today why that is and what in your life, like there probably are stellar women in your life who have these gifts and show them and like are living in them. But um, just, a, just a gentle challenge to say, like, maybe that's not fully right. And we, we can do some work to reframe and redeem um, these gifts in that way. So I just yeah. wanted to put that out there. Yeah. Um, great. So we're going to transition into the gifts. Um, we're going to share some examples, what they are, and then talk a little bit about what they look like in health and unhealth to give us a bigger picture of what it looks like if we're walking in those gifts or if we love and care for people with these gifts. Yeah. Um, so we're going to start with service. And service is a task-oriented gift focused on meeting the practical needs of those inside and outside the church. Service is the task, the thing. There is a need. I can show up and I can do that thing. Um, and it's also, I just want to share, like, it's not just like I can do it myself, but I know someone who has a resource who could show up for this person or this need. And so I'm going to connect to those people. And it's really important that we recognize that every resource has really important practical kingdom value. Mm -hmm. So as we're sitting in, um, and, we, and again, we think that we're like, oh, I checked the thing, I painted the wall, whatever. But it's so much more than doing the task. Um, it's showing up for, with, with whatever you have or how some, you can connect with somebody to meet that practical need, both inside and then outside the church. Um, and then so some ways that a healthy person walking out in their gift of service, they have a deep joy. They love doing the thing. They show up when it's like, hey, we're painting our church back in the pre-times. Like those people show up for every one of those events. They might not be, have any of the physical tools like, like paint buckets or things, but they show up to clean, to do the thing because there's a need for our people, for the community, for someone. I can show up, somebody's moving, and they get a deep joy, and that's really exciting. Um, another thing of, of health for people with the gift of service is they are aware and alert of a need that's happening. Sometimes, which is really fun, before the other person knows they even have a need. So they can kind of intuitively sense that there's something going on and they can provide, um, they can meet that need with something that they have, a resource, or they can connect them with someone who can meet that need. 
Um, and then this doesn't really, like, I'm gonna say it, but it's kind of self-explanatory, but people with the gift of service are detail-oriented. Yeah. They know all the little bits and pieces that are happening and they can show up in confidence to meet those needs and it's kind of just in their brain. Like there's no, I don't know how to explain it other than they just know. They know the things that are happening. Um, so people, or some patterns of unhealth are a hard time saying no, I am guilty of this, a hard time setting boundaries because we always wanna show up, we wanna do the things we wanna serve. Uh, because it brings us joy. However, there's a fine line between that, like consuming our lives and us actually showing up for that person. Um, and then when we do that, we can exclude other people from serving. So when we show up and we're like, I'm gonna do, we kind of hoard the service piece and we, we miss an opportunity to invite somebody else into sharing that thing of service, into um, offering their resource into a need that needs to be met. And then the last thing for this right now is just critical of others who don't sense or understand the need. And I've, I've done this, I'm guilty of my life in the past of just recognizing like, oh, it's so clear to me, like why doesn't anyone understand that this thing has to happen? And um, other people aren't wired that way. So recognizing, so if that's someone, if, you, if that's you and you're wondering if you have the gift of service and this is kind of, you can flash back to your life, places where you've been critical of other people not recognizing the need, this is probably an indicator that you have this gift. Yeah, because I think a lot like personality <clears throat> Sometimes we're going to most clearly recognize the gifts when we recognize in humility the places where we've um, misstewarded, unstewarded, not stewarded well uh, the gifts that we have and going, oh, there's this inherent way that I see the world that I'm not always aware of um, that actually uh, affects how I judge other people because to me this thing might be the most obvious thing, but that's not always the case. And in a healthy ecosystem, when we bless other people to have different gifts, we recognize that the different ways they see the world are important and necessary to our growth as well. And then we more freely contribute our perspective to the whole. Um, and I think one of the things that I really love about the gift of service especially um, is that it speaks to one of these core principles of the heart of Jesus, which is the heart of the servant leader. And I think this is actually really foundational um, to Christianity. I think it is uh, revolutionary, it was unprecedented, and this is maybe one of the major things that has changed uh, the world uh, since, since Jesus came to reveal to us what God is really like. So there's this little portion of Matthew 20 where his disciples are arguing, and they're like, oh, I want, like, let this one sit at your right hand, and this one at your left hand, and we're going to rule the world and all this. And Jesus detects in them there's this idea that authority and power is kind of based on strength and pomposity and like how high up the, the ladder you've climbed. And so he challenges that assumption that they are, they are bringing in from the world um, to this new kingdom and mentality. And unfortunately, I think many of us, we take that, king, that, that em empirical way of living and power and authority and we try to translate it into the kingdom, but this is core kingdom principles. This is Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. Uh, Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, in the ancient world, that was completely backwards, upside down logic. That does not make a lick of sense. Because whether you're Jewish or you're Greek, or you're certainly if you're Roman, power and authority is about your rank and, and how much sway you have over people. Humility was not even a valued virtue in the ancient world. And this was the revolution of what it is that Jesus brought to the world. And we even see this later on, like as, as the hour of, of Jesus' crucifixion is coming closer, what does he do? He takes off his outer garment and he washes the feet of his disciples. This practical act of service that carries within it a powerful symbol of the new reality of the kingdom among us. And I think that's so important for us to differentiate because a lot of times, if we still have that empirical Gentile notion of power, when we come into the church, we have this attitude that service is going to inherently cost us 
and keep us small. And so we're very resistant to serving one another because we think people are going to take advantage of us. They're going to take us. And there's only so many resources to go around and we become very miserly. Um, But I think a really beautiful kingdom principle is this idea that we can actually find healing through serving other people. A lot of times we think, well, I can't really serve other people or, or do this thing until I find the healing that I need within my soul. Um, but a lot of times it's the action of stepping out in faith to do the kinds of things that Jesus did, to proverbially wash the feet of other people. Um, that actually brings so much healing for us and properly aligns us with this kingdom mentality. And so I think the challenge that people with the gift of service, when they're walking in in health, the thing they challenge all of us with is what if serving other people, was serving the world, what if that actually sustained us instead of draining us? What if laying down our lives time and again, what if taking up our cross, what if washing the feet of uh, the stranger and the overlooked and the oppressed actually became the thing, like the way in which God saved our souls? So that brings us to the second gift, uh, which is very similar. Like I said, it's hard to overly parse these things out, and that's the gift of helps. So helps is a relationally oriented gift focused on seeing others realize their vision. So there's a subtle difference between the gift of service and the gift of helps. As Alex was saying, service, this is kind of the the, the easiest way to understand it. Service is primarily uh, focused on task. What are the things that need to get done around here? Where helps is more primarily focused on people. That when you're devoted to a person or to a group of people, you say, what needs to be done for this person's vision to be realized or this group of people? How do I come alongside and whatever I need to do to help that person? It's, it's very much guided by affection. So we see this a lot in scripture. We see um, with young David, his best friend, Jonathan, who's actually Saul's son, is devoted to David and and wants to see David thrive. And there's this deep love and admiration between the two of them. Uh, Another amazing one from the Old Testament is the story of Ruth and Naomi. Uh, Naomi is a widow. Um, Her daughter-in-law, Ruth, her husband dies. And and Ruth binds herself to Naomi and says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. And your God is going to be my God. And so Ruth, because she's dedicated to Naomi, will do whatever it takes to see Naomi healthy and whole. Um, And then in the New Testament, when we look at the book of Acts and through the letters that Paul writes, we find there's so many supporting characters that that had caught the vision of what Paul's role was in the kingdom and came alongside of him to support him. So um, we talked about Barnabas a couple weeks ago with exhortation. I think very often people have a gift of exhortation and helps together. That Barnabas was devoted to who Paul was as a person. We see Silas, we see Junia, we see Apollos, we see Epaphroditus, we see Timothy. All these people that believe in who Paul is and want to see his vision fulfilled. Yeah, and I think what's really neat about all of this is there's a very practical, physical uh, reality of the gift of helps, and then sometimes, which I'm guilty of forgetting, that there's a spiritual reality to the gift gift of helps, and that's like, you know, it takes a little practice, because it's easy to show up for someone, and then it's a little bit harder to recognize the spiritual element of it, but I, I was as I was prepping and reading, um, I came across this quote that was, was really moving about like how people with the gift of helps show up for people, and it's not always in a physical, practical yeah. way, yeah. but it is very much as a like in that relational sense, out of um, like affection for someone and care for someone and love for someone, that we show up and just let them be, oftentimes, and so um, it's this idea of that people with the gift of helps can can sense or understand when people are hurting or battling something or having a hard time and we can show up and move them and like sit with them and move towards them with um, an encouraging word or kindness or um, loving conviction where we can challenge them in the thing that they're struggling with or having a hard time with but we show up in love for that person first and foremost not for the thing that they're battling or the thing that is hard or broken in their lives right now but for that person and saying I see you and I'm for you and um, this and which I, we don't necessarily put language to that but that's very much in this understanding of the gift of helps is being with someone and um, I mean, countless times I have friends who 
Um, you know, they just needed to lay down on my lap and cry. And I'm like, okay, great. Like that doesn't cost me anything. And it's because I love them and I care for them that I can be with them in that hard space and then help them move towards or just like encourage them to like, okay, like what's next? What do you need? How do I show up for you in this way? Um, and one really great thing that I, we're excited to share, I'm excited to share as I was prepping, is in Acts we learn about Tabitha. And there, we're gonna read it, so you know, hold tight. But there's this really fun things that, I, that jumped out about her story to us. And so you can follow along with us. Oh, yeah, so Acts 9. Um, In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. And it's so fun. Sorry, I just, I'm really bummed about this. Um... I think, like, I've always heard that story, and the focus has always been on, like, he tells her to get up, and she gets up, and that's been the testimony, but if we back up a little bit, it very clearly says, like, she did good, always was doing good, and helped the poor, and, like, if that isn't someone who lives out of the gift of helps, I don't know who is, Mm. but what's really neat about this is that, and we've talked about it earlier already, is that there's an emphasis on the widows, and if we take an imaginative journey back in time, Like, widows were not top-notch in class. You know, we're called to care for the widows, so it's even that is telling to us about what the widows were and who they were in their life. And she brought them in. We don't know how. We don't know in what capacity, but she made things for them, robes and other clothing, and she showed up, and they were grieving the loss of their friend, probably because she poured so much into their life. And so that's just really a neat story for me to reframe it than what I was traditionally taught learning in that way. Um, so really fun. And then so some ways of health and unhealth for someone with the gift of helps. Um, if you're in a healthy state with your helps gift, you have good memory. You remember specific things, birthdays, anniversaries, interviews, jobs, like all these things about people because we care so much about them that you're going to have that just kind of floating in your brain about it. And then with that, you're just encouraging. You have a spirit of encouragement and you care for people. And so you're always going to, there's plenty of people I'm thinking of right now in our community who do this really well. And so you just lean into that and it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't feel like extra work. You're just so happy to show up for someone in that way. Um, And then a really interesting one is that you ask good questions. And this feels kind of a weird, like healthy place, but you do it with a genuine curiosity for that person. So how do I move into a relationship with someone? By asking really good questions that kind of gets a little bit under the surface rather than like, how are you? Or where did you go to school or whatever? But like really deep things like, and I won't, I won't give us examples because then we're stuck into the box, but you know, you know, you know how to ask good questions. I believe in us. Um, And then the really key thing is that you just jump in when there's a need. There's something that you can help. You just jump in, I'm there. I have something to give and I can offer that. Um, Some patterns of unhealth are being overwhelmed or taking too much on. And this is similar to the gift of service where it's like, oh, I want to do all the things and I want to help all the people. Um, It gets a little bit hard to do when we don't create boundaries and safe spaces for ourselves as we're walking out in those gifts. And again, I've lived this, so I'm speaking from experience, but also encouraging us that we don't have to live in that spot of being overwhelmed forever. And then one thing that's really neat in in both uh, like, oh, that's really not fun in a state of unhealth, but learning to uncover what that looks like is that we can take things personally when when we're in a state of unhealth as someone with the gift of health. This typically looks like you show up for someone with with a need and you you wanna help them and then they kind of reject the need and we take it as they reject us. And that's a hard, it's it's like, I'm like, yes, to myself. But it's a hard place sometimes to recognize that like, oh, there might be more going on rather than just like, oh, I'm going to take it personally because I offered something really great and why didn't you take it? And so that's kind of the narrative we tell ourselves. 
But I think it's really important to even in those places that are hard to say like, okay, Lord, like I don't know what's going on here, but I'm going to trust you and trust that like this person is still for me. And then we can still show up for those people. Even like they didn't do anything. They were just in a different state. So again, it goes back to asking questions and caring for them in that spot. Well, I would even say <clears throat> that taking things personally and not great at setting boundaries can sometimes be that your motivations are kind of less than mm -hmm. pure, where you have this kind of unexpected return on an investment yeah. of like, oh, I'm reaching out, I'm doing all these things for you, and I'm remembering your birthday, and I'm showering you with gifts and attention, and you're not reciprocating mm -hmm. because there's a need in myself that I don't really want to admit to, mm -hmm. and so then you can tend to become bitter there, and, and, yeah. and so that's... That's like, I think like what you're saying is just like, okay, why am I feeling the way that I am? Mm -hmm. Why am I taking this so personally? Do I first check my own motivations and kind of get back to that place where I can give and love freely because I'm being affirmed in the Lord, mm -hmm. not seeking that in other people? Right, right. It's just a lot of work sometimes, you know? <laughs> yes. You got to get there, but I believe in us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. So we're going to move on to our final gift of the bunch. Um, which is the gift of administration, which uh, as we've been prepping, this one has been really fun because it's uncovered a whole bunch of new things um, for me in my life. Um, and so administration is a gift devoted to developing systems and standards that encourage the holistic growth of the organization. That is a lot of words, and that feels like a lot of things, <laughs> but it's really significant and important, and sometimes we don't think of it this way. And I will, I do want to say that sometimes when we think of corporate world administration, we think of administrative assistants or secretaries or high-level people who are administrating some project at a very high level, which those things are true, but I think we're, we're going to uncover some really deep things that's not just that, because that feels very task-oriented, and the administration is more like systems and procedures and people. Um, so it's really fun. So what I learned is that the Greek origins of this word means shipmaster or captain. And I told Ryan that we should get a fun hat for everybody who has the gift of administration because that feels fun. Um, but we'll find it in the budget somewhere. I think that's pretty worth it. Whatever. Anybody sews? We'll make our own hats. Um, <laughs> but I think it's such a neat thing to think of somebody with the gift of administration as someone who is leading something, like a captain of a ship or a shipmaster. I'm not a nautical person, but I know that those are important roles. Mm -hmm. Um, and what comes down to it's different about the gift of administration is that it involves vision, and that's something that we miss in the corporate America definition of administrative. And vision is understanding like what's happening for the greater good of, of everybody. And so it cultivates a desire for the common good for everyone. So it's not like I have a vision and it's my way or the highway, so thanks for coming. It's more of I can see what's happening around us in an organization, in a church, in a family, and can say, oh, this is where we need to move forward, and I have vision for that. Or I can take someone else's vision and say, okay, I see where you want to go. Here's how we can get there together, and then we don't lose anybody in the process. Um, and, yeah, so it's this really fun thing where you know the, the bits and pieces, the Tetris of it all, of putting things together, but you also understand the people. So it's brain, and it's intellect, and then it's heart, and it's the spirit of people pushed together into one really fun <laughs> gift and knowing. Um, and I just, I wanna say like, we can do the tasks. People with the gift of administration can do the tasks, but without the vision, we, like if we're not given the opportunity to lead out of that vision, we're gonna be unsatisfied, unfulfilled, mm. and just feel like, oh man, something is missing here, or even frustrated that other people don't see what I see. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. such an interesting like play in that. So if you've been in a role where you, keep, you feel like you're saying the same thing over and over again and no one's really listening or paying attention and you just kind of do the, do the work, this could be an indicator that you have this gift. Yeah. And um, as we were prepping, I came across this quote and I want to share it because I think it's just a big, um, it gives an, a, a big indicator of, of what the sense of this gift is. And so I'll read it and you'll just read with us. Um, in steering, we let others lead. This means we know and love from a distance. We show up, ask questions, make decisions, all for the benefit of the whole. This is a call to love blindly, to show up in the physical and spiritual realms for the team, group, church, and people. And there's, again, so many things to unpack there, but um, in the same article that I read this in, it talked about like people with the gift of administration die a thousand deaths of themselves. And so in the same way that we die to ourselves just in our normal lives, like there are things that we give up and sacrifice for the greater good of the whole when we have this gift and we're leading with vision. And, and sometimes those aren't like spoken and sometimes they are. So, 
I think one of my favorite examples of this gift on display is in the Old Testament in the story of uh, Joseph. So this is the Old Testament Joseph, not Jesus' stepdad, half-dad, whatever. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with the story. Joseph is kind of his father's favorite son. Um, he's one of many boys. Um, and he has this amazing dream um, that basically he interprets as someday his brothers are all going to bow down to him. Uh, and so Joseph does, as many of you who are maybe the beloved baby of the family would do, is that you go around bragging to all your siblings about this dream that God gave you, um, which is a big mistake. And even the, the like moral number one from Joseph's story is, if God gives you like a really big vision about other people like bowing to you, keep that one close to the chest. Like don't let that one out too much. Like slow down and ask him if this is something you would share. So naturally, his brothers not big fans of what he's saying, so they conspire to kill him. Um, but kind of at the last minute, one of his brothers says, well, let's not, let's, kill, let's not kill him, let's just throw him in a hole and leave him, as one does. So they do this. They beat him up, they throw him in a hole. Um, eventually, some people find him. They take him into slavery all the way in Egypt, and he's, he's a slave in Pharaoh's house, in, in the larger household. Now, during this time... Pharaoh starts to have these really crazy dreams that he can't make a lot of sense out of. Um, and they seem to be very economic in nature. They're about cows. They're about wheat. Um, none of his wizards can really figure out what's going on. So moral number two, never trust a wizard. Um, and eventually someone finds out that this kid, Joseph, is actually pretty good with dreams. So they invite him in, and Joseph is able to accurately interpret the dreams uh, for Pharaoh that are from Yahweh. And he says... I think there's going to be, in a couple years, there's going to be a huge famine, and, we're, and there's going to be a lot of, like, we're going to run out of food, so we need to prepare now for that time inevitably coming. And Pharaoh is so blown away by this. He says to Joseph, all right, I'm putting you in charge. You're, you're in charge of the whole kingdom and getting us through this season that's supposed to come. So Joseph begins this process of like taking a census of like everything that's available to Egypt in the time and starting to put away the necessary stores to help the whole country through the famine that's about to happen. And sure enough, the famine comes along, um, but Pharaoh's kingdom is okay because they have the necessary stores to get them through this difficult time. Now the plot twist towards the end of the story is that Joseph's brothers find themselves in Egypt seeking out food. And so they come to the palace to see if the, the Pharaoh will, will give them anything. And lo and behold, their little brother Joseph is kind of Pharaoh's right-hand man, and they're kind of freaked out. Um, but Joseph comes to them, I think, with a bit more mature love than the first time he did. And he's like, this is the fulfillment of the, the dreams that God gave me all those years ago. And of course, I'm going to take care of you. Um, and they're basically able to move in and provide for him. And I love the story of Joseph because, yes, there's this amazing prophetic element and there's these dreams and there's kind of that wow factor that we talked about last week, like healing, deliverance, miracles, that kind of thing. But there's also this powerful gift of administration where God is giving Joseph, he gives him this prophetic vision, but then he gives him these divine strategies on how to see that come to fulfillment. And I love that it's this marriage of these two equally valuable things, prophetic vision and divine administrative strategies to take care of God's people and to see them carry that on into the next generation. Yeah, and I love thinking that um, even the people in the Bible that we look up to, like the story of Joseph, have their health and unhealth moments, which we could probably just, in his story alone, pick a bunch of them. But... Um, so we'll talk about some of that. I think it helps us ground a little bit of our own, where it's like, oh, yeah, the people in the Bible, they weren't necessarily perfect. They had their, their health and unhealth moments as well. Um, so someone with the gift of administration, when they look like in health, is that they can articulate the vision. They can say, oh, I have, whether that's like something that the Lord gave them specifically, or they hear something that somebody else is doing and say, oh, I actually understand what you need, and I can help you get there. And so they have an ability to put language that's not just like, focused on one person's interpretation, but being able to give, again, for the good of the whole, a language that people understand to get on board with the vision and move on, uh, move forward in that way. And then the next one is uh, momentum towards the goal. So there's an active forward motion of, okay, let's get all the people or things or systems and procedures in place so that we can move forward together. And I love a plan. I don't know about most of you, but I love me a plan. Um, and then, again, asking good questions. We need clarity to know how we're moving forward. What is the vision? 
Um, this has been, at least in my work life, in the last year or so, really advocates become kind of a joke. Like, I'm like, oh, Alex needs clarity. And it's like, yes, I do. <laughs> I do need clarity. And um, not as a joke, like, it's like, haha. But this is it's like, I'm going to always be one of the first people to ask some sort of clarifying question if yeah. it's unclear to me. Or I'll sit on it and I'll come back. I'm like, what did you mean by this thing? Or what is this? Because, again, I love a plan. And I want to make sure that we're moving forward in the best way possible. Um, one thing that is related to asking good questions in this way is a story that Ryan reminded me of. Several years ago, we were working on just setting some goals for the church for the next five, 10, that kind of stuff, years. And um, there was some, <laughs> some like things that weren't clear. And so I was like, hey, I have an idea. Yeah. Why don't we bring some people in from our church? I'm gonna run a mini like research process with everyone. We sat in one of our rooms here. And I gave everybody sticky notes, and I asked specific questions, and then we bundled up if the answers were similar. And um, that really laid a lot of the foundation for our vision and our mission and where we're going. And so I didn't do that for that reason, but I just I needed some clarity so I could lead well with where we were moving at the time. Yeah. And so the other part of this is if you love sticky notes or post-it notes or something that is like an organizational plan, like that might be an indicator that you are either gift adjacent or you have this gift uh, because I love that. And, and, <laughs> and if you're constantly getting frustrated at me because I'm rather comfortable in ambiguity and I'm, I walk through the world according to my gut, um, that is also an indicator you probably have a gift of administration. Yeah, we, just need, we need some we need And some why clarity. I need people like Alex in my life to go, hey, cool, let us in. Yeah. <laughs> This is, this is not going to hurt you, it's for your benefit. Um, and then an attention to detail. Again, similar to sticky notes or having a plan, just an ability. And, and this is really significant, not just an attention to detail in the work, but also in the people. So knowing like how people are wired, um, and not maybe on a deep level, but just understanding like people thrive in this environment, not in this environment, so we'll, we'll put them in this space so that they can bring their best gifts to the table so we can thrive together, again, as a whole. And then again, organizing well, I love a plan, I love those things, but organizing in this case in terms of people is similar to just knowing who they are and how to make the best team, which feels really like corporate-y, but it, think of your family, think of your friends, like think of you know planning a trip, what is that anymore? We don't know, but planning something where it needs some sort of organization. Um, and then encouraging others, being able to show up and say like, hey, you're doing a great job at this thing, or I know this is hard, um, stick at it, let me know what you need. Similar, again, like to the other two gifts where you just have this encouraging spirit to help people. Yeah. And then some patterns of unhealth, you have a hard time articulating vision. So whereas if you're in health, you can take the words and put it together and everybody can understand. And then when you're in unhealth, it's harder to do that because we could be overwhelmed and it could be hard to be focused. So those are kind of connected. Hard to focus on the vision, hard to move forward, feeling a little bit stuck because we're just not sure what's going on. And that might be um, some external factors. Mm -hmm. If you're leading in this gift, it might not just be you. It might be that you haven't been given the space to have that vision or that leadership to move forward. So that's something to keep in mind as well as you're working in your teams for work, life, or family. Like if you're feeling a little bit stuck, that could be one reason why. So one of the things that I've loved, you know, this go around teaching the spiritual gifts is that many of the gifts kind of lead into this deeper discussion about the, not just what the gifts are, but the way in which we're called to hold them. Um, and they speak to these deeper truths of, you know, the heart of God on display in his people, um, or, or what it looks like to reconcile the world back to him. And I think these gifts, service, helps, and administration, are really great examples of this idea that just because we have a gift does not inherently mean that we're automatically using it correctly. Sometimes we think, oh, well, this is my gift, therefore every way that I'm operating it must be justified by God. No, it's a gift, but it's our responsibility to steward that gift well. So how do we understand, whether it's these gifts or it's any of the gifts that we've been talking about or the, you know, the ones that we're gonna kind of finish out the series over the next couple of weeks with, um, how do we know when we're stewarding it well? We can read all the books, we can listen to all the podcasts, but honestly, what is the gauge for knowing when you're walking in fruitfulness when it comes to the gifts you have? And I think these, these are the question, two questions that are so pivotal to me. Does the way I'm practicing this gift make me look more like Jesus or less like Jesus? So number one, 
within myself. And I think this is so, for me, this is really freeing when it comes to making decisions or thinking about calling. You know, sometimes we're so prescriptive and we think God has this like overarching plan and if we mess it up, we, we've got it wrong somehow. But to say, if I, the way I'm practicing this gift, do I look more like Jesus when I do it? The Jesus revealed in scripture, the Jesus revealed to me through the spirit, the Jesus revealed to me through the people of God. Do I look more like him or do I look less like him? So you can even see from what Alex is sharing in service and helps and administration, we can actually operate in those gifts in a way that it makes us bitter, it makes us self-conscious, it makes us manipulative, mm -hmm. but we can operate in those gifts in a way that it makes us generous, in a way that it makes us leaders, um, it, would, it makes us patient, um, where we see other people set free and thriving and raising in maturity. And that's the second question. Is my whole community raising up in maturity in Christ? So when I operate in this gift, is anybody getting left behind? Do I favor certain groups of people over other groups of people? Do I use this gift for my own self-aggrandizement or am I genuinely using it to serve the body of God, the body of Christ to raise them all up? And I think these gifts especially are ones where it's so easy to hold our gifts in such a way that we believe our identity and our value is in our gifts. Um, that I believe I am what I do so I think this is the number one killer for people with the gift of service and for helps in administration is when I believe my value is based upon me living out this gift, I've already lost it. Mm -hmm. Because your value is not based on what you do. Your value is based on who you are because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. But even the more subtle vision of like, I am what I contribute. If I'm not serving, then I'm not doing the right thing. But knowing how to take care of yourself, knowing the seasons that God's calling you into for a lifetime investment of true, genuine service. You know, people with what, the gifts that you have, you should never stop doing those gifts in order to find health in the long term. Like there might be seasons where God's calling you to step back for a second, but you are your fullest self when you are living out of those gifts as a reflection of the intimacy that you have with Jesus. And that's gonna be the subtle difference for those of you who have the gift of service, health, and administration to know, am I being Christ-like in the way that I operate in this gift? Or do I have a Messiah complex that if I don't do this thing, it won't get done. And I, and I love this kingdom mentality that you and me and Alex, like we are not necessary to the work that Jesus is doing in the world, um, but, it brings him joy to have us along for the ride. It brings Jesus joy for you and I to say yes and to partner with him in his rescue project for the whole world. So what does that look like? <laughs> what does it look like to show up? Or what are the gauges that we can bring to the table and to the Lord to say like, this is what, what I have and how do I will work towards being more Christ-like and less Messiah complex-esque in our lives. And as we were praying and prepping, the, the word that I heard the most was humility, was we have to show up in, in humility, which feels weird to show up in humility because it's such a like, you know, meek thing, but it is an active thing to be humble and to show up and say, uh, you know, I'm Lord, this is for you. I want to show up in this way because you've asked me to. We, we can't show up for other people when we're self-centered. We can't help other people when our egos are leading us. We cannot help bring vision when, we're, when we only care about ourselves in the process. Those things just don't work because you'll end up very quickly on the unhealth of most of these things and, and probably hurting some people along the way. It's just not how we're wired to operate. It's not helpful for us to say like, oh, I have this gift and then you just are not kind, like at a basic level, but you show up in humility time and time again, which I'll be honest, it is an active thing that I have to take to the Lord because I love being like the, the person that helps and does the thing, but like, I can't, that's not sustainable. Like I, it's not, my life has taught me otherwise, but that's just not good. And sometimes I forget and I do it anyways. And so I have to be very active in, and like giving those parts of my life to the Lord so that I can reframe and reorient and say like, you've gifted me this way, I can show up in that way with this thing, for this person, for this organization, for this event. I can show up because the Lord has, um, has like softened me in that and it's not like my thing to fix or do. And then the other side of this, which feels a little counterintuitive, is to show up with confidence. And in the corporate world or in the social world, we think of confidence as like, Look at me, I'm so cool. And we do all these things in terms of like 
like those people are confident. And I think we miss the spiritual aspect of confidence sometimes when we only think of that one thing. And so when I was, again, praying and prepping, what I heard was this idea of like, we show up in humility to, to Jesus and say like, hey, take these things and help me be more like you. And then we show up in confidence to stand on in, in like that power stance, knowing that like the Lord made us this way. If you are, and in general, this isn't just to these gifts, but yeah. it is specific to these gifts that the Lord made us this way. And so I can show up in a room and help fix something in terms of vision, or I can show up to someone's life and just let them be because they're hurting and I, my presence is healing to them. And I can show up to a need and paint a door or a window or, no, you don't paint windows, but you know, I can show up and help somebody in their housework uh, because the Lord made me this way. Yeah. And I can show up in the confidence that he has given me. And I wish I had some like, this is what I've learned, top three tips for your life on how these two things work together. I don't. The only thing I can offer, which I think is still really important, is that it is an ongoing act of surrender to the Lord and to yeah. show up and to say, Lord, like you didn't make any mistakes <laughs> when you made me, which feels hard to say sometimes because <laughs> we can probably all roll out a list that feels like he did, but he didn't. And that's a truth and that's a promise of our lives that like he, he knew what he was doing when he created us with these specific gifts. So when we show up and we surrender those things to the Lord, we can show up more fully like kingdom people when we act out in our gifts of service and helps and administration. So um, we want to wrap up by just praying a blessing over the people in our community that specifically have these gifts, um, but in that deeper sense that all of us would come to appreciate and practice what those people uh, most beautifully and accurately depict to us about the heart of Jesus. So um, again, if, if, if any of those gifts, they resonate with you, um, go ahead and give us a little shout out in the chat just so we can celebrate you um, and just see you as being part of the fabric of our community. So let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, I thank you for every servant, every helper, and every administrator um, in this community. Lord, I bless them as the backbone of our church, the people that help to give us structure, to provide the space that is ordered and uh, safe and loving and careful for the rest of us to thrive in the gifts that we've been given. God, I pray that the people in our community that are so powerfully gifted with service and, and helps and administration would not find their identity in what they do or they contribute, would not believe that acting out of those gifts is inherently going to cost them and, um, and diminish them. But when they find their intimacy in you, they find affirmation in who you say about them, that they can freely give and demonstrate um, your love through those gifts in such a way that all of us raise up in maturity in Christ together. So God, I pray that even now you would be, pray, um, you would be speaking to those people in our community that have these gifts, that you would remind them of the valuable place they have in your kingdom. Yeah, Lord, we do thank you for the way you've created us, for um, that, that we all um, have an option to press into the gifts of service and helps and administration, and uh, we probably have throughout our lives without even recognizing it, Lord. So just remind us of the spiritual aspect of these gifts and um, how they are kingdom-oriented and how... For, for our community and for our families and for our workplaces and for wherever you have placed us in our life, Lord, that we can show up to help people, to serve people, and to give vision and leadership into the places that uh, you've called us to, Lord. So be with us today and this week as we continue learning and pressing on. We just thank you for what you're doing in our lives right now. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little else I need.
say, be thou my vision, yes, Lord. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great father and thy thy true son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, no man. throughout this week that we would be sensitive to your spirit and your leading <laughs> thank you Jesus we love you amen thanks for joining us today I hope you have a wonderful week um, I pray that the Lord is meeting you in this discovery of service and helps and administration or that you have new language for how to care for the people in your life that have the gift of service, helps, and administration. If you have any questions, you can Slack me. I'm available. You can find me, uh, but I'd love to talk to you. Uh, so a couple of reminders of the things that are going on. Today at 2 p.m., our elder Steve Wimmer is going to be leading a conversation about the gift and the vocation of evangelism. Uh, which is definitely one I think that we want to kind of reimagine and, and waken back up. So um, go to the weekly, sign up for that Zoom conversation at 2 p.m. today. Bring your questions, your, share your experiences, your fears, your doubts, whatever it is. He's the guy. He's going to really help you out with that. And then also a reminder um, to sign up if you're interested in jumping into one of these house churches. We really want to continue to meet together, to gather in fellowship um, to bind ourselves to one another in this hard season and make sure, like we were talking about today, nobody gets left behind, that none of us drift from Jesus or from the family. And this is going to be a really great opportunity for us to do that uh, moving into the foreseeable future. So other than that, go forth in peace. God bless. We'll see you next week. Bye.